I was basically just quick, no left foot, no head in, just one of the fastest people in Birmingham. I remember coming back from Sheffield Wednesday on loan, and um, I just scored on loan for Watford Sheffield Wednesday. About thinking, I hate football. Luckily, it was me who was the next best thing that was available. So if it was out of choice, I would still be in the reserves. You could go out on a Saturday, be hungover on a Sunday, train on a Monday as a 19, 20-year-old, and you feel normal. Everyone knew around Birmingham I was a party boy. I know you, they can't do it now to the youth team players, but it made me who I was. You're not just coming to play football, you're coming to work. You get to play football as enjoyment afterwards. And O'Neill was addicted to me. You know, he was like, wow, you're quick, you're in. People will say you lost pace, but I was still quicker than everyone else. So maybe I lost a yard from bulking up a bit, but I managed to probably stay at Villa for longer by bulking up. We wouldn't always choose the worst player. We choose the player who's going to bite the most. Let's go Nigel Rear Coker. He's going to bite his. He'd be like, no, you're joking me. I was never the worst player. A lot of people don't really know the truth around the time where I did put weight on. Why would I want to put on another shirt? Di Matteo, they're trying to force me out to Reading and Rangers. Had no chance. I'll be here longer than you, Di Matteo. I'm not going nowhere. You are listening to Claret and Blue. An Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Great job, Gabby, on the Claret Blue podcast today. Gabby, how are you? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Um, can't complain. How about you? you yeah, okay? well, not too bad. I'm uh, all right. We'll start from the very beginning, mate. Um, back in Erdington, what was you like as a kid growing up at school? What are your earliest memories? At school, I was well behaved, out of fear. From my dad, to be honest, um, because he was so strict, you had to behave at school, you had to do your work. But then later on in the uh, uh, secondary school, I sort of didn't concentrate on my work. And I got away with it with my dad because I was doing so well in the um, Villa Academy. So I sort of like got away with it then. But um, always behave, I was always good. That was one thing that we weren't allowed to do, behave bad. Even after school, you know, like there was kids playing on the street outside my house playing football we were never allowed it had to be in the back garden or the park we were never allowed to um go and hang around by the shop where all the lads used to hang around it was just my um, my strict nigerian dad basically you know he didn't want me to be on the street he wanted me to be um playing football watching football that's it couldn't play playstation couldn't watch anything else no films football education that's it He's a clever man as well, wasn't he? He's got a PhD. Yeah, he's got a PhD, yeah. Um, very clever man, you know. So he, he, he brought over that mentality of, like, um, football or education, you know. Um, what you do in your young, younger years, it's what you you reap when you're older. That was his motto, you know. Um, being a kid isn't to enjoy life. It was being a kid is to start your journey as an adult and what you're going to do when you're older. Obviously, you look back now, you know, and you, and you think, you know, there was, three, there was me and my two brothers in um, two bunk beds in one room, you know. So you, you look back now and, and like, you, 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 you realise, I don't know, just everyone was in a tight house, you know, in Erdington, um, Stockton Green. Morning till night on the six weeks holidays, football, you know, I mean, we only come in to make our own lunch or um, breakfast. And it was just constantly football. One man, Wembley, we played um, like non-stop all day, breaking fences. So it was just uh, 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 just a case of like keeping yourself busy, you know, as, as a kid. And with us, it was never allowed to hang around the street. It was football or um, education. Where was you playing? Perry Common Park or somewhere around there? No, no, no. Always local. Um, so it was always um, Marsh Lane. I don't even know um, a Stockton Green too well. There's a park on Marsh Lane. Um, like a little park, you know, and we used to play in there. So it was walking distance from my house. What was your earliest memories of football then, Gabby? Where, what, what club did you play for? Where did your dad take you? From a young age, I started playing for Great Bar Falcons. This must have been from the age of maybe seven, eight. I think around that age, maybe, maybe um, younger. I started playing for Great Bar Falcons and um, carried on playing for them until... Yeah, I reckon it was a good, maybe from like five, six, and I left them when I went to Villa at 13, I think, 12, 13, maybe 14. Well, it was just playing at um, Great Bar Falcons, and the pitch was um, King Standing. 
where we used to play, um, the home games. And I also remember, like, just loving football, you know, even from a young age. My dad said, like, football was everything to me. Um, at school, I'd be the one that's, like, um, coming home with the shoes torn, coming home with yellow shirts from sweating all day playing football in the playground. You know, all the kids are doing silly things in the corner of the, of the playground or messing about. I was just always, where's the football at? Do you know, like, it was sort of an addiction. And I think that carried on for um, Great Bar Falcons. I mean, um, if you ask anyone who's got records at Great Bar Falcons, I was scoring, like, ridiculous amount of goals. Because I think at a young age, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, if you're so much quicker than anyone else, you're going to score goals in, um, in um, you know, Sunday League football. Even when I take my son now, some of the players that you see, with their speed, it's like, the rest of the players at that age are like a million miles away from them. So it was just something that like my speed helped me at a young age to stand out and um, just playing football every day, you know. And then um, by the time I, I got to 12, 13, that was when I got scouted for um, playing for the local district, Erdington uh, Assault District. So who was, the, who was the scout that spotted you and what was the game? I'm not sure, you know, because um, so so I've never got scouted playing for um, Great Bar Falcons, even though I scored a ridiculous amount of goals and stood out. I don't know if maybe then the scouts weren't coming to them games, you know. But I got scouted by, because um, I went to St. Edmund Campion School, I, I was one of the better players in my year. I got into the district, so basically it was the best players in each school in that district, you know what I mean, go to the district. And um, I remember I didn't really want to go and play for them because I was training two day I was I was training a lot during the week I was playing on a Sunday and you know like sometimes at a young lad you like you want your Saturday to yourself sort of thing you know after a long week at school but my dad was like you know go 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 to it it's good it's the district and then I played a couple of games I've done well for the district and um Aston Villa scout I don't know his name but he scouted me from the district to um to come on trial at Aston Villa so what are your first memories of the Villa Academy then um when, when did they snap you up and stuff so I think it was um, roughly um, around 12, 13. And I remember getting the, the call saying, um, you've got a trial at Aston Villa. So get your stuff. You um, you go in there to do some training. And then after a week or so, I had a trial game. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was um, It was crew Alexander away. So basically it was a trial game, but it was a proper game for the youth team. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, back then you could have like maybe one or two players on trial. You could come and play for Villa Youth or whatever. And then um, I scored a hat trick in the game. And then straight away on the coach after the game, the academy director was like, um, um, "We want to sign you. We're going to offer you um, a contract." But at that, at people didn't know, and Aston Villa didn't know. At that same time, I'd been scouted for Wolves, so I was doing the same at Wolves. So. Days in the week, I was going to the Wolves training ground, training, playing games for them. So at the end of that, it comes to a stage where I had to choose between basically athletics, Wolves or Villa. Mm. And because I was a Villa fan, you know, and um, with my local team, it was a no-brainer. So I chose Villa. Where did you get your speed from? And what, what's your athletics background there? Um, I don't know, you know. like my, my dad will say he was quick, but, you know, I don't believe him. But... Um, I don't know. My brothers were quite quick as well. Both my brothers, Charisma and Michael. So I don't know. It was maybe just my genetics. But my dad said since a kid, you know, like in um, in sports day at schools, in primary schools, I'll be the one that just left all the kids. And I'll stop, look around, see where everyone is, and then run again. You know, it's just something that, like, you're blessed with. Yeah. I reckon if you look back at videos of probably Mbappe when he was six years old, I bet you'd be like, wow, this guy was the quickest in the in the country, you know. And it was something that, like, in the summer holidays, me and my two brothers, we'd, you know, Alexander Stadium? Yeah. We were allowed to go there, so my dad would give us money to um, get the bus and then pay for um, Alexander Stadium. But as we do, we um, sneaked in through the back, jumped over the fence, didn't pay the entry fee, and used that money for sweets on the way home. But we'd go to Alexander Stadium, you know, use the track, and just be sprinting. It was just something that, like, me and my brothers liked to do, run fast, you know. Back to the academy, Gab. Who was your, I mean, what was the group you were playing with at the time? Who were the players there? And who was your best, best, best mucker at the time? So, through the academy, like, um, I think Craig Gardner come a bit later. But 
Yeah, it was it, it was the players that were there that didn't make it. The ones that did make it were, were basically Craig Gardner. Me and him were like couldn't be separated, you know. Um, I'd go to his house in Yardley, um, see his family, you know. I think he got every assist for my goals in the youth team. So I think I broke the record. I think from Vassal for um, youth team goals in um, a season, I was under 16s or under 18s, one of them. And every goal was Craig Gardner because he was so good at, um, you know, technically. He always used to find them balls over the top for me. And obviously my speed, you know, just helped me run through and score goals like galore in the youth team. So my, my, my main memory would be Craig Gardner because he was the one that was with me through the academy. Mm. He's a blue nose as well, isn't he? Yeah, I think, you know what, I think like, I, I think the area that he was brought up in, Yard the ACOS screen is I'm sure I'm not like a, a, a scientist on like where Birmingham is, but it's more blues territory, isn't it? I reckon Craig sort of hid from everyone because he's at a Villa Academy. I think if you, if if Jamie Carrick is Everton, isn't he? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like Everton fans. So I think it's just something that Craig Gardner hid and then when he got a chance to go to Birmingham City, I think he just, you know, wanted to do it. Um, like um, Gary, I think um, the whole family are Blues fans here. Yeah. So you coming through the academy then, Gab? Um, what was the moment you thought you was on the cusp of the first team? O'Leary, your first manager. Yeah, you know what, mate. When I look back, like even though I was banging in goals in the under eight, it was different back then. You know, you had to be like super, super, super special to get anywhere near the first team. Does that make sense? Like yeah. ahead of me at that time were the were the Moore brothers. You know, um, in the academy, like, and it was just like they were young. That makes sense. They were in the first team, but still young. So you sort of thought, "Am I going to get in?" They've got the Sal, they've got Phillips and Gal, you, more brothers, Cart and Cole come for a bit. So in the under 18s, I was thinking like, I'm doing well, but I'm not really getting a sniff. I'm not even training with them. You know, like sometimes under 18 players who stand out will train with them. And then I got a bit um, into the reserve team and um, still I wasn't getting, you know, I was banging in goals, but still not getting in with a sniff, you know, of um, training with the first team or the first team. Then I went out on loan and I hated it. You know, I was homesick like you wouldn't believe. The first was Watford and I went there, I was just like, what am I doing here? You know, like, because you, cause you, 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 you've been stuck in a house, not seeing the real world. You know what I mean? All I seen was my house, my brothers and sisters, mum and dad and then Villa training ground, to go all the way to a hotel where I was staying in Watford on my own. Do you know what I mean? And then going around new people, like, it was a bit too much for me at that time, at 18. I remember coming back from Sheffield Wednesday on loan, and um, I hadn't scored on loan for Watford Sheffield Wednesday. About thinking, I hate football. I, like, I do not like football. Like, this is what it's like. I don't like it. And then, as everyone says, you get your luck in football. Sometimes luck is what you need. And that's what happened. You know, I was back in the reserve team, playing reserves. And then all the strikers got injured or ill. So O'Leary basically come and knocked on the reserve team manager's door and basically said, who have you got? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> We're we fighting for scraps here. Who, who, who have you got? Who's the next best thing, you know? So luckily it was me who was the next best thing that was available. So it wasn't out of choice from O'Leary. If it was out of choice, I would still be in the reserves that season. There was basically no other choice to play me. And back then, it was always 4-4-2. You know, it was never 4-5-1, which, um, which helped me. So I remember the game. Um, I was quite nervous, but, you know, it was a big, big moment for me. My dad was in the crowd. And I just thought to myself, I need to do something to stay around it. The, the players are coming back next week, some of them, you know, from illness. And I um, remember the game wasn't going very well. Everton were a strong side back then and then um, we were getting battered to be honest I just remember Lee Hendry putting me through I took a shot and I even look back today I mean Richard Wright should have saved it mm. you know it wasn't a very clean um, shot and it went in and I think that's the luck you need in football sometimes me scoring a 19 year old local lad sort of like made the local media remember my name mm. if I'd if I'd not scored and Villa had lost 4-0 then I probably would have been back in the reserves and maybe not had the career that I had. Exactly. I think it's just the fact that I scored. My name was out there. It's debut goal for a 19-year-old local lad, Villa fan. You know, so that's sort of like, 
probably forced O'Leary to keep me around the first team for the rest of the season. So who were the first team players that, that came to you first? I mean, and the coach up to Everton, who, who warmed to you? Who made you I think it was, it was more like Lee Hendry and Gareth Barry, you know, because they'd done it. They'd been through the academy. It was more them, to be honest. Like, Lee Hendry was good. He was like, play, play your game, you know, your assets are, and Gareth Barry as well. So it was more them two, to be fair. And... I think sometimes when when you're 19 and you're 18, 19, you're that young, you are nervous. You're around like the first team players that you were cleaning their boots um, a couple months ago. So you're in awe of them. You know what I mean? You 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 like wow, that's so and so, that's so and so. So it was it was an um, unbelievable experience, and and I still put it down to luck of um, you know, strikers being ill. Mm. Who's, whose boots did you clean, Gat? Um, Gavin McCann's. Um, <laughs> he weren't very generous, by the way. But um, I remember he had these tempos, um, night tempos he had, and um, they were quite hard to clean. You know, they were the leather ones, and like you had to like use the hose, the freezing cold mornings in December. Use the hose, the hose them down, and then you had to dry them. Then you had to polish them back. Then you know what I mean? It was like shoe polish, polish. So you'd have polish all over your fingers before you start training. Then like, I had to go and do the Lucozay bottles, fill them up with like Lucozay cordial, then water. Do you know what I mean? Like then clean the Lucozay bottles as well. But when I look back now, like I know you, they can't do it now to the U team players, but it made me who I was. Does that make sense? It's sort yeah. of like you're not just coming to play football; you're coming to work. Do you know what I mean? It was like these are your jobs at work, and then. You get to play football as enjoyment afterwards. I think that was the 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 way we saw it, you know. What would you have been if you were a footballer? Gap. You talk about jobs there. Maybe a club rep <laughs> <laughs> in in Ibiza and Broad Street. Maybe no. You know what? I, I was clever. I was very clever at primary school, and then I don't know what happened at secondary school. The work got harder, but like I stopped being clever, and I sort of like I remember I was getting coursework and this and that and I remember doing my GCSEs and sitting there thinking like I haven't got a clue here I don't even know why I'm sitting this so like my my grades were like awful at GCSE levels you know like because I was just just so addicted to football and it's a good job I didn't make it because I don't know what I would have done I would have probably went to college maybe done some sort of course or it would have been hard you know to um, to make a career because all I knew was football which was a Maybe a silly risk because I think other players maybe done the same in the youth team and didn't make it. And then, you know, you, 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 it's, it's not a good thing. And that's why academies now are more, you've got to do a course while you're um, in the academy because a lot of players don't make it today and I could have easily been one of them. Yeah, so you come through now, Gab, you signed your first pro contract. Uh, what, 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 what do you treat yourself with your first pay packet? You know what? I was quite, I was a real chav. I can't lie, I still am a bit, but I was a real chad back then. You know, Erdington lad was yeah. I love Speed Garage, like Speed Garage Raves I used to go to. So what was popular around my neck of the woods was Lacoste tracksuits yeah. and um, Sergio Tacchini tracksuits, um, one tens. So I, I remember when we were my best mate, I treated my best mate and me, we went to um Bullring. There was a Lacoste shop in Bullring and um I brought a bright um, blue Lacoste tracksuit and um, I think a few more I uh, brought my mate a bright red one and um, we got some one tens you know it was just basically like my, my first signing on fee I was just like I'm going to treat myself you know and it was like back then that was the trend you know in the in the local area it was like um, Lacoste tracksuits everyone was addicted to them you know with the collars the zipped up collars and um, yeah that was what I treated myself to I had, a bit, I had a turquoise one and a T in it as well. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm yeah. I'll, I'll the same. I can't lie. I'll the same. You've gone through the academy in the first team now. You're around the first team set up. How are you feeling now? Training the locks and, you, and girls yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it was like, I, I felt like I was, I was one minute I'm cleaning bowls, next minute I'm training around these players. And you just you just tell straight away the standards up. You know, like people, like, people don't understand how good the likes of Lee Hendry were. Like, he was an unbelievable player. Do you know what I mean? Like underrated, I think. Like and in training, you're like, wow, their first touch, their their finishing. Do you know what I mean? Build up play. Um, do you know what I mean? Like 
shape they were doing, like Gareth Barry. Like, I was like, whoa, look at Vassal. Vassal's actually a good finisher. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm just watching all this and I'm like, wow, I'm involved with this. And then, luckily for me, I think O'Leary left that summer and O'Neill come in and O'Neill was addicted to me. You know, it was like, wow, like, like, you're quick, you're in, basically. Do you know what I mean? You want, you was in, uh, like, love youth and pace. So, a lot of players sort of left. And it was basically built a team around, like, I think for the first season, Luke Moore on the left, me on the right, and Gal in the middle. Do you know what I mean? It was like 4 3 3. And I, I didn't enjoy playing right wing, but I'd done okay there my first season, you know, be, being as a right winger because of the pace. And then, um, yeah, I just remember, like, being more comfortable with mine on the all coming around it because I, I'd had, like, six months' experience of being a first team um, player. Is he, is he the biggest influence on your career, Martin? Yeah, a thousand percent. Because if he didn't come in, I think maybe like O'Leary would have brought in more players and, you know, I probably wouldn't have got the chance that I did. And then when Martin come in, like, I think a handful of games I didn't play for the whole time he was there. Mm. You know, like, he just loved me, you know, and I loved, like, giving back to him. It was like a father figure, you know. I remember when I'd go in for, like, um, contract negotiations with him and my agent, he'd say, play the games, score the goals, and the contracts will come. You're not going to get the contract straight away. And I think that's what's missing now in the game, I think, is that with me, it wasn't like... <clears throat> I was getting new contracts every year because I'd earned them. Yeah. There wasn't, like, massive contracts for five years. It was, like, little bits of increasing money and appearance fees and... You've got to go and play 40 more games to get a new deal. You've got to go and score a certain amount of goals. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't just giving too much too soon to a player. If that makes sense. And that's what Martin was like. He was like, wanted to keep me hungry. And then um, it was just like a father figure, really. So I owe it all to him, to be honest. You was getting better and better as well, weren't you? You was quite a skinny, you was skinny kid, weren't you? Whip it rapid. Um, yeah. When you start realising, actually, I'm quite good at it. I can, I'm going to make a decent career out of this. I think it was like Martin's first season had gone. It was the one afterwards, I'll say 2007, 2008. I was just basically like, you can ask the, um, the academy director, Brian Jones. When I first come to Villa as a kid, I'm not going to lie, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I could score goals, but that was at Sunday league level, which like most people can score goals. I was basically just quick, I'm not going to lie. No left foot, no heading, just one of the fastest people in Birmingham for my age. So, from my debut season for two years, the more games you play, you're playing against high standard of players in the Premier League, so you're learning from them. Oh, he's just touched the ball there. He's turned like this. He's let it through his legs and then ran through on goal. He's touched it. Do you know what I mean? Like, in training, I'd always work on my left foot because I knew that I had to be both footed. And I think that helped me through my career because I scored a lot of goals in my left foot, you know? And um, I just remember, like, for them first two years in the Premier League, just practising loads and learning game, game by game, getting better game by game from learning from my opponents, learning from my teammates in training, practising. And then it comes to, I think, it might have been the 2008 season, and I thought, I remember thinking, like, I'm getting better, do you know what I mean? I'm scoring more goals in my left foot, with my head. I'm, like, I'm, I'm getting more of a complete player rather than just a young player of potential who's just quick and can score the odd goal. Mm. I'm starting to turn to a player who can score with any foot, score long ranges, which I did, score um, one-on-one, score tapping, score headers. You know what I mean? I tried to, like, I felt like I became an all-round striker, someone who could play on the wing and cut in and score goals. So I think it might have been that 2008, 2009 season where I started to believe that, like, I can get a chance of like um, playing for England and and then um, becoming a more complete player, which I did. What players did you like look forward to playing against? You would reach all the time. Any anyone that jump out? You know what? Because of my pace, I fancy myself against anyone. To be honest, you know, like I think like it's different when you don't have pace. It's sort of like maybe harder. But when you've got pace, you fancy yourself. And I always remember playing against um, Gary Neville. I sort of like, because I like to, because my idol was Cherry Henry, I always wanted to be in that left hand channel. Does that make sense? All my runs would be, majority of the time, if you look back, would be in that left hand channel. So I remember always liking to play against Gary Neville and 
you know, yeah, use that channel. Um, I remember, I remember on the McLeish against, um, I like playing against Gary Coldwell because he was a great player, but he was so slow. You know, like I always like to pick on the slowest defender. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, mm-hmm. and even like, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to like put down certain names, but I always used to do my research and think like, who's the slowest defender on their team? That's the one I'm gonna go on. Do you know, like um, some players now pick on the weakest defender, big strikers. I always picked on the slowest defender of like, wow, he's he's not quick. I'm I'm over to him straight away. You know. What what did you do the hundred meters in Gab? What's your hundred meter time fastest? You know what? I put something on Instagram the other day with so I was bantering. I said ten seconds. I was getting a lot of nibbles because uh, <laughs> people are like, no chance you got that no chance. But you know what? I never timed it, which was something I should have done. But I never timed it. Um. Which is which is a shame, but I don't know. I think back then I remember doing a Nike advert with um, Theo Walker and Aaron Lennon, and uh, I think it might be two thousand and eight, and like there was nothing between us, you know. So I think we were like the three quickest in the league, and yeah, I think um, yeah, it's hard to say at time, but I reckon definitely under eleven, I, I'd say so at my at my quickest of my career, hundred percent. Did anyone beat you in a, in a race at Villa? Adama Traore, perhaps, or someone? Do you race him? Well, when Adama come, no, I was a bit older, weren't I? So he was yeah. definitely quicker than me at that age. But I reckon in my prime speed, I reckon it would have been a good race between me and Adama. But um, it would have probably been neck and neck. But I remember, like, Carl Walker, when you come to Villa, me and him used to, uh, to like, we used to do practice games and I'll play left wing, he'd play right back and he'd try and knock it past me and he couldn't get there. I'll try and knock it past him. I couldn't get there. Do you know, like, we're both at our, like, quickest, maybe. And, like, yeah. um, we were both similar um, um, speed. But I just think, like, when I first come onto the scene, maybe, maybe mine on the first season, I don't think there would have been many quicker than me at that um, at that time. You know, because I was a lot um, lighter. I didn't feel that out yet as a man. I was still a little boy. I think that was my quickest um, year. Mm. Uh, so when did you start bulking up then was that your call to do more weights what, what was what was the thinking beyond that gap you know what um, I remember it like just that it was the year Martin left the season Martin left um, and I started to um, at the start of that season I didn't um, Darren Bent come in there um, so I wasn't playing and formations had changed that year to like one up front so I said to myself if managers looked at me, would they look at me as like a lone striker? Maybe not. And if they're only playing one striker, so I thought to myself, you know what? Why not get in the gym, build your muscle up, start lifting weights, and like build your body up? And what was lucky for me at that time was I was still filling out as a man. So every year from 19 to 24, I was still filling out as a man. I was getting taller. I was getting um, like, I mean, my legs were getting bigger. I was getting more um, bulk. And that was the year where I thought, let me build my body up so I can play more positions. I can play left wing if needed. I can play striker on my own. So I didn't want to like manager to say to me, oh, I can't play you on your own because you're not going to be able to hold the ball up as a physical outlet. You know, you can't win headers. So that was the, that was the main reason. And yeah, people will say um, you lost pace, but I was still quicker than everyone else. So maybe I lost a yard from bulking up a bit, but I managed to probably stay at Villa for longer by bulking up at that time, you know. Formation changed, didn't they, that year? That was when no one played four four two, So it wasn't a big man or a small man. It was basically just a big man. Uh, talk a bit about your England career, Gabby. What was it like being called up and being tra- around the squad? It was, it was amazing, to be honest, you know. Just to, to even, like, train with such superstars. I mean, back then you had superstars, Beckham, Terry Ferdinand, um, Ashley Cole, Lampard, Gerrard, Rooney. Do you know what I mean? Like, they were superstars to me. Like, And even though I played with some amazing players at Aston Villa, you go into England and you're like, wow, these are superstars. The standard is, like, unbelievable. Like, like <laughs> no one gives the ball away. And you're just like, wow, this is how, like, they are at the top. Do you know what I mean? These are how they're the top players in the league and the top part of the league because the standard's so high. I just remember, like, just enjoying it, you know, and, and like, when I made my, my debut, um, 
against Germany away, I was thinking, like, these are our rivals. Do you know what I mean? I've been brought up to not like Germany. Do you know what I mean? Like, to, 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 to sort of, like, no, we don't like Germany. When we, when we, when we, we can't beat Germany, we're losing to Germany. Then we beat Germany finally when we, we beat them 5 1, was it? Mm-hmm. I just remember, like, the whole country was like, wow, we beat in Germany, you know? So to play in that game, I remember being told three hours before the game and no one expected me to start. I think like it might have been Carton Cole or Darren Bent. I think they expected to start. And Capello named the team out and I was like, he felt like you're joking, I'm playing. Do you know what I mean? I'm playing against like Germany who we we, 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 we don't like sort of thing away as well, you know. And I just remember like just loving it, you know, I enjoyed the debut, you know, he went all, all right, I didn't score, but um just to make your debut, it's like, wow, I play for England. This this is the, like, the, do you know what I mean? The 18-year-old kid who was, like, in playing reserves at Sheffield Wednesday. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And in the space of a few years, I'm starting for England. So, for me, it was an amazing experience. I should have got more caps, definitely. But if you said to me at the start of my career, I'm going to get three caps and play with some of the players I played for England, I would have beat your armour. Mm. And going back to your Villa days, Gabby, you spoke to Martin Larson this week. He said you, you and uh, Ashley Young used to play up terrible. Some of the pranks you, you, you'd do, and you'd, be, <laughs> you'd be fine quite a lot. Just, just what, what, what did you and Ashley used to do? You know what? I'm not gonna lie. We were little. <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie. Like, like we were, we were like the, the teachers' pets. Do you know what I mean? You know, you get the teachers' pets who like sort of get away with anything. Well, that was me and Young. You know, Martin. We were his favourites, so like um, we got away with a lot, but. We'd, we'd just be like, I don't know, just just wind-up merchants, you know. But that was me all through my career, you know. I've always thought to myself, let's have some fun. You know, training doesn't have to be so serious. Yeah, you get your work done, but let's have some fun. You know, we're normal lads. We're not robots, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, any normal lad wants to wind um, their mates up, don't they, and play pranks on them. So I think we'd just, like, we'd always wind up Nigel Rea Coca because he was um, an angry guy. And I remember we used to do every Friday, we used to do like um, old, old V Young. So like it was like five aside, five aside, um, no, the pop, sorry, he's 11 aside, but it was old V Young basically. And the winning team got to vote the worst player in the losing team. And if you lost, you had to wear like um, a yellow jersey for the week. It sort of said like loads of like horrible things on it, like your crap. You're rubbish. You're a donkey. Um, so no one wanted to lose it to, to get that shirt for banter rights, you know. And we wouldn't always choose the worst player. We choose the player who's going to bite the most. Do you know what I mean? It's boring, isn't it? If you're choosing the worst player, so we'd be like, me and Young, you would get together and be like, mm, let's go, Nigeria Coca. He's going to bite his, and he'd bite. He'd be like, no. Joking me, I was never the worst player. Furry, furry shirt on the floor, storming, and then like the management's like, for God's sake, we got a game tomorrow, and like players were unhappy because of this. And I remember the worst one was um, we got Thomas Sorensen. We thought he's a biter here. We can tell he's gonna bite, and he was fuming. He was like, "What are you talking about? How, what do you want about? I made seven saves, giving us these stats, and we're just like, like, relax, mate, relax." And then we done it to um. Later on in my career, we've done it to um, Enzogbia and he lost his temper. Yeah. He threw his shirt on the floor. He's gone, f*** all, f*** all he is. Like, f*** is. And then walked in the changing room and he was fuming. Who voted for me? And we're just laughing, thinking, like, it's so easy to wind people up. You don't realise. So I think that was one of the biggest things. And when I got it, I just laughed because I wasn't a biter. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, like, no one would vote for me afterwards because... It was like, let's get the biter. And I think one time we um, voted for James Milner and he was Martin O'Neill's pet, his top pet. And mm-hmm. Martin O'Neill went, no, 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 he's not having it. That's crazy. James, no way you can vote for James. And everyone's laughing their head off. Say, Gaffa, he's got the vote. He's like, no, no, this week, no vote. And he wouldn't give him the bib because he loved him that much. He's, he's like his, his favourite son. And, um, yeah, it was hilarious. But me and Young, we just, like, just winding people up in general, you know, like, um, yeah. So, you get, I think, like, you need that. Fun. I think even the players today at Villa, they do the same, you know. It's um, have fun as well whilst you're doing your work. 
Oh, what, are you, what are your funniest stories from Villa? Anything? I mean, you could be making a cup of tea now. Anything jumps to your mind that makes you laugh out loud, kind of thing? You know what? The one of the funniest was it was um, a player called Nicholas Hellenius. He used to come in some rascal clothes. Do you know what I mean? Like some people used to come in some rascal. He used to demand no effort at all. And the one day he had some rascal t-shirt, and then um, we all signed his t-shirt basically. So imagine he's got his t-shirt hung up in his um, locker. We went in there and started signing it with a with a pen, um, a permanent marker. And then Paul Lambert used to love coming in the changing changing room because if you got caught on your phone, it was five hundred pound, even in the changing room. So Paul Lambert used to come through the back door, the side door to go and catch people. He loved it. And the one day he come and he's like, "What's going on here?" And we're like, "Oh, uh, we're just signing his shirt. It's a rascal. He's gone. Let me have a look." Yeah, it's a rascal. One second, let me sign it. So even the gaffer signed it as well. And then like Nicholas Eleni has seen it, he was fuming, and like he left the training ground after, after training, but he wasn't happy. But that's just the banter that like happens in the changing room. It won't be any different now. If you don't lock your stuff away with the code that you're given, you, it's your own risk. So from that day on, trainers were getting stuck, glued down. Do you know what I mean? Like your trainer was getting glued down to the carpet. Carpet was getting ruined. It was it was carnage. Do you know what I mean? Like. <laughs> If you left stuff out, it was like people's cars were getting moved to where you couldn't find your car in the training ground. You know, like it was like a war zone at like all the way through my Aston Villa career. And I think um, one of the funniest stories was um, Shay Given and Fabian Delph. So Shay used to always, um, Shay was like king of banter as well. He's got a big mouth as well. He's chirpy. And he's always, like, winding up Delphi and, like, winding up people. And one day, Delphi got all um, Shay's pills and threw, tipped them all on the floor. And Shay used to take a pill for everything, a pill for his back, a pill for his car, a pill for his toes, a pill for his hair. He had, like, 100 different sets of pills. So Shay was fuming. But what Shay done that was clever was he waited till our last game of the season and we had an away game. So everyone sort of left their cars, you know, and some players didn't come back and get their cars because of the last game of the season for three, four days, you know, once the season finished because they might have stayed um, in the city that we were staying in. So what Shay done is he got a piece of fish, fresh fish, and pull it in Delphi's um, car. And don't get, don't, and don't be fooled, it was like a hot summer's day, the last game of the season. So imagine a uh, raw fish in your car for four days and, sh- and, sh- and Delphi had a brand new Range Rover. So um, three, four days later, the season's finished. And Delphi must have went and got his car. He was like, what's this smell? I can smell, I can smell fish, I can. And then um, Shay's laughing in the group. He's like crying his eyes out, like <laughs> laughing. And, and Fabian's fuming. He's like, where's your house? I'm coming to your house. Send me your address. I'm going to kill you. Do you know, like, because it's a new car and, you know, like, what you can imagine what a fish smell in the sun's going to smell like for, like, a while. I think Dalphy couldn't get the smell out for weeks. So I think that was one of the funniest stories. I don't think Dalphy's got him back yet. So I think it's something you'll probably try and get him back when you get his hands on him. But that, for me, was, like, the ultimate. You know, like, players went too far sometimes. And I think that was the ultimate of, like, there's no boundaries, really, with players. I think mm-hmm. what 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 would have been next is maybe like someone's windows being put through, <laughs> but players are like you know like it's something that players love to do at training. You know like before training and then after training, it's like a war zone. What was all the fines like? You mentioned Lambert's five hundred pound one there. What was some was, of the, the maddest ones? That was something that like I just didn't understand. You know like your change room is meant to be your space. Does that make sense? You know like. Before training, you might be on your phone. After training, you want to come in and maybe see if any of your family a message. You know, there might be emergencies or anything. And I think that was a bit of a power trip from Lambert. And I, I did like Lambert, but I wasn't too keen on that because I don't think any other club would say you can't use your phone in your changing room. Fair enough, you can't use it in the gym. You can't use it in the canteen. You can't use it in reception. But your change room should be your space, shouldn't it? So for him to do that, it was like... You've got to use your phone in your car. Then you've got to come into training. You've got to rush out to your car for training because you want to see if anyone's phones are family members. And I remember Jordan Bowery. It was his first week. And he'd come, obviously, not on great money because he'd come from um, League 2. Do you know what I mean? 
So he would have been probably one of the lowest paid. And um, <laughs> Lambert walked in through the through the back door of the, the dressing room, which is by the showers, and he caught him straight away. He was like, Jordan 500. And Jordan was like, oh, my God, what the f- I've not even been paid yet, and I've been done 500. And, like, you had players in the toilets, hiding the toilet cubicles, the showers, to use their phones. I was one of them. And then... Um, Lambert would love it. He'd come in so much. There was three entrances to the changing rooms. He'd come in, catch people, and other players would throw their phone under the towel. Honestly, it was hilarious. But when you got fined for that, you weren't happy. You know, 500's a lot to, like, being on your phone. That was one of the biggest ones that I found. Because any other fines were right. You know, like, getting sent off or missing a game through suspension or using your phone in the... Um, the physio room or the gym they're fair enough you know but um, yeah Lambert they were crazy fines and I think it was a bit of a power trip from him Who some of the funniest managers what was, what was Tim like and- I really liked Tim Sherwood you know um, when he come in he was like he had that sort of like London you know the Londoners they've got that like swagger you know like the way he speaks he's and in, having, a, having won the Premier League with Blackburn and you know like he just had that he knew what he had to do to keep us up, and he'd done it. He um, he got me on side. You remember him saying to me, like, you, Ben Tech, and Wyman are going to keep us up. And he said it to us before the West Brom game, when we beat West Brom, and I scored at Villa Park. And he just knew what to, to how to get the players going. You know, he, um, training was lively. He changed training to make it more fun, but more hard work. And um, it was just funny as well, because he had that, I don't know, he had that London swagger about him, like, you know, like his feet up on the chair in the canteen, you know, like, he had that swagger of, like, one of the chaps, like, so I really like Sherwood, and um, I still think to this day, if he, if he kept this job and not got sacked, and we brought in um, Nugget, Remy Garde, I think we would have stayed up, you know, he, he had all the players on side, and um, he was a good manager, and shame he, um, he, he's not working at the moment, but he was tough when he had to be but you had the banter with it as well Do you know what I mean you tell mm-hmm. stories about when you played and different things so he was one of the, the funniest ones Lambert was funny as well because you could tell that he had not copied but used Martin O'Neill you know the, the rugby top and the glasses and the, the track suit for games you know he was Martin O'Neill like watching Martin O'Neill you know and then uh, just some of his stories, Lambert, and like, I don't know, just the way he used to like hammer players, but in a funny way. You mm. know, like, I don't know, if a player was like having a bad day, he'd be like, oh, God, um, I think I brought the wrong player. You know, it's like, like, but like funny banter. And I think he, he was quite funny, Lambert. And even some of his sayings he used to say, um, like, you can't kid a kidder. You can't, you know what I mean? Like, he just. <laughs> He just had funny sayings of like, you know, like of putting things. Martin O'Neill as well, you know, I think like he was funny in his way because he'd sort of be ruthless, Martin. Like, I've not met a manager ruthless as him. If you had a bad game, he's telling you, he's telling you you're useless. You don't deserve to be here. Like, Martin was ruthless like that. But other times he was funny as well where if you're winning, you could do whatever you like. If you want to like do kick-ups across the pitch in training he wouldn't give a damn as long as you win on a Saturday does that make sense because that's the most important thing isn't it I think a lot of managers get confused of like I want you to be the best player in training but then some players will be the best player in training and then on a Saturday they're useless and they they're, they're can't do it on the big stage mm. don't get me wrong the perfection is to be the best in training and the best in games but you're not going to always get that do you know what I mean our players so Martin was like, yeah, training's got to be good. But training wasn't a great, great standard. I mean, Martin Larson and Olaf Melbourne played up front in training and celebrated goals, singing in like in their language that they spoke. And like, back then, at them, them sign of training was just like, okay, this is fun. Never used to do set pieces. Do you know what I mean? It was basically Martin, on the, Martin Larson stand here in the centre and you come head everything. That was our set piece tour. Do you know what I mean? It was more like, go out there and do it on a Saturday. And then... Um, that's all Martin wanted. You used to get some big wins at Village. Did you go town celebrating all the lads? Where was, where was the hot spots you used to go to? Well, what, 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 you know, you know, in them times, we, we, we won a lot, didn't we? 
Do you know, like under the Martin O'Neill era, and being a 19 year old boy, a 20 year old boy, 21 year old boy, so well known, you know, like like in Birmingham, you know what I mean? Like Villa are the main team, you're one of the main players, you're from the area, everyone wants to be your friend, girls galore, you know, you know, just that like whole footballer like lifestyle. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, once the game had finished and I'd seen my family i was out mate i'm not gonna lie i was out do you know what i mean like where's where's the club at i'm not gonna lie and say like oh, i stayed in because that's a lie but a lot of the other players sort of like some were family men for me man i was um so bar bamboo meet you do you know what i mean give me a season ticket i'm there i'm not gonna <laughs> lie like <laughs> i'll be there do you know what i mean like like as long as we win and no as long as we win or draw basically i'm there i say it all the time not everyone is like a James Milner, Harry Kane, who eat the right food and drink the right amount of water per day and get the right amount of rest. I'm not going to lie, I wasn't that boy. I was a 19, 20 year old, 21 one lad from Irvington who was out enjoying life, enjoying being a footballer, doing my hard work, playing well on a Saturday, then out and like enjoying the nightlife that most young lads out there do. Even the footballers are not footballers. Just because you're a footballer mean, doesn't mean you're not going to want to go out and enjoy yourself. So for me, it was, um, I'm out. So bar bamboo was every week. Bushwhackers. I mean, I was whacking the bush with everyone else. Do you know what I mean? Until 6 a.m. But back then, you could do that. Like, you could go out on a Saturday, be hungover on a Sunday, on your day off, train on a Monday as a 19, 20-year-old, and you feel normal. If you ask any 19, 20-year-old out there now who who's not even a footballer who, who parties hard on a Saturday. By Monday, you're fine. Mm. It's only when you get to 30 where you need three days to get over your hangover. So, yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. And, like, back then, like, if I look back now, no regrets. You know, I enjoyed life. I trained hard. I played hard. I had a good career. And, um, obviously, I made mistakes. I'm not going to lie. I made a lot of mistakes. But at that early time, when I was doing it on the pitch, no one was bothered about what I was doing off the pitch because everyone knew around Birmingham I was a party boy. It's something you can't hide, you know, but because I was doing it on the pitch, it was something that um, no one cared about, did they? Mm, exactly, mate. So you mentioned mistakes. Then what, what mistakes are you alluding to there? I mean, what, what, do you, what, 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 what do you look back at? A lot of people don't really know the truth around the time where I did put weight on, you know. Around that time, under um, the season we went down, I was going through a lot of, like... Um, Things off the pitch. I mean, I was in the papers on the f- on the front page of the Sun three days in a row, and like people don't realise that. And you're a footballer, yes, but you're still a normal person. So for me, it was like you know coming home and like oh, I'm on the paper again. You know, you get into that depressed feeling. Um, you're playing football and the team's not doing well. Do you know what I mean? You're losing. Then you've got stuff about your personal life about. Um, woman maybe in your life and then it's coming out in the paper and you're like oh my god like this is half bullying from the sun do you know what I mean so that was a part of that that season with me putting the weight on and like me not playing to my potential it was because of off the field stuff do you know what I mean and mm. don't get me wrong when I went to Dubai should I went to Dubai when we're in a relegation battle no way do you know what I mean I'll regret that for the rest of my life of like going to Dubai and smoking shisha and I think at that time like I said I had a lot of things going on in my personal life when you go through that stuff it's it's never nice and I think when I had the party um with the balloons you know in the in um, in London after we got rid of Gage do you know what I mean I, I think I regret that for the rest of my life as well do you know what I mean like that was a big mistake for me but when you're depressed and you're um, going through things off the field, you know what I mean? Everyone deals with it differently. Do you know what I mean? Like, should I have had a party? No way I shouldn't have. But maybe at that time for me, it was like, as bad as it sounds, it was like maybe alcohol that made me like, do you know what I mean? Like get over things that are going on in my personal life. So I think that whole season from, um, from when, was it? Yeah, from when Sherwood left, that was what I, I remember Cher was saying to me, like, are you okay? Like, this has come out in the paper today. He'd been told, he's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm struggling a bit, you know, the the the, the son is sort of targeting me. Do you know what I mean? With, like, my personal life and my um, my girlfriend at the time and my um, kid's mum. So it was sort of that, that sort of stuff sort of brought on 
the sort of like putting on weight and not looking after yourself and and then the the things that I done with the shisha and the balloons, you know. So I'm not making excuses, but to Villa fans out there, it was more things that were going on off the field. You know what mm. I mean? Like that um, made me do them things. Yeah, we're not all robots, are we, Gav? You know what I mean? When people do, when the dust settled, and like maybe now when people look back, they'll think like, yeah, he was wrong. But he's a normal guy. He's not a robot. He's not. Um, I don't know, a goody two shoes. He's he's never been that guy. Maybe if if social media was around when I was nineteen twenty, do you know what I mean? I would have been in a lot more trouble. Do you know what I mean? It was only social media that that come on later in my career. If social media was around when I was twenty, twenty one, twenty two, do you know what I mean? Like me coming out of clubs in the West End in out of bushwhackers and do you know what I mean? Like it would have been a, probably a lot a lot more from that age, if yeah. that makes sense. But not all players aren't robots. I'm not the last player or the, the, the first player to make mistakes. Do you know what I mean? I think sometimes fans can connect to players as well when they know that, like, you know what? He's a normal lad from Stockton Green Erdington who's made a career in football, but he's still that Jack the lad who will do silly things and has done silly things all his life. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's one of them things that, maybe people will see he's, he is just a normal lad. He's not uh, a lad who's been put through private school and been a good excuse. No, he's a normal lad from Erdington who's um, just been jacked the lad and been out with his mates and done things maybe that he shouldn't do, have done. Retired really early, didn't you, Gabby? Um Any regrets about retiring at that age, 31? Not at all. You know, um, I, I said this to my next-door neighbour yesterday. I was speaking to him, like, um, 10 metres apart, as you do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I said to him, like, that this is the truth. Like, at that time, I remember on, when Bruce gave me um, a chance, I got fit and um, I scored in the derby, didn't I? And in that pre-season, um, after that, I was, like, in amazing shape. You know, Steve Bruce was buzzing. Um, I'd been doing an early pre-season in Portugal with a few players. Then the preseason, I was flying. Like, I was breaking records of runs that I hadn't done for six, seven years. Right. But even then, I knew in myself, my legs aren't the same. My pace isn't the same. My legs are sore after like training. You know, you just know that like the miles are clocked up on you. The season started. I scored in like, against Hull. But even that game, I still didn't feel like the player I used to be. Does that make sense? I scored, yeah. but I didn't. I remember sprinting for the goal and like that I scored I sprinted for it but afterwards I couldn't sprint for another 5-10 minutes I felt fit but I didn't feel fit um, my legs just didn't feel the same after a game I was like I can't walk for two days my body sort of just saying to me like like this is enough maybe all the mileage from playing from a kid through the youth team through an early age the, the numerous sort of sprints I've done over my career I don't know what it was but and in that season, I started to pick up injuries as well. So I was injured all the time. Calf, hamstring, calf, hamstring. Villa shouldn't have given me a new deal. I didn't deserve a new deal. Do you know what I mean? Like, as much as like, me and the club were close, you can't give me a new deal when I've not played enough games that season. I'm not the player I used to be. At the end of that season, I sat down my age and I thought, I don't know if I want to carry on because, for one, my body's telling me to stop. Two... Why would I want to put on another shirt? Do you know what I mean? Like, I had a chance to leave under Di Matteo. They're trying to force me out to Reading and Rangers. I had no chance. I said, like, I'll be here longer than you, Di Matteo. I'm not going nowhere. That was the exact words in the office with the owner and Di Matteo. I was like, you're not pushing me out. I don't want to put on another shirt. It's not an option. At that time, I was like, I got the club relegated as well. I want to make it right. And then, longer it went, obviously, the offers are going to go worse and worse because... The longer you don't play football for, the worse it is. Does that make sense? If, if it comes to like August, September, October, November, January, do you know what I mean? Like you can't not play for that long and then expect anything to be good. So even like the, the time from when I left Villa to when I actually retired, I knew myself I wasn't going to play again. But the only reason why I made it public was because I started to get silly offers. People were giving my number out. I was getting offers from Wrexham, from Solihull Malls. I was, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like, I was just like, okay, I've got to make this public now. That was the only reason I made it public in the March because I thought just to like, sort of like, make everyone know 
I'm retired. I'm not playing again. There were offers from Aberdeen, and no offense to these clubs, but like, I'm not going to play for Aberdeen. So, I mean, I played at the highest level for Aston Villa. I'm not ending at Aberdeen. And, and some players are different. Like, some players will play, they'll go to Forest Green until their legs don't work no more, until they're 38, 39. I think everyone's different, aren't they? For me, it was like I wanted to go out on a sort of high of like, I'm a one club man. I'm not going down the leads. Do you know what I mean? And my body sort of told me it was time. And yeah, it's early 31. Don't get me wrong when I like play my last game. But everyone's different. You know, mm-hmm. Gareth Barry's still playing at 38, 39. Me, I relied on my speed. So I'm not going to never play that long. Do you know what I mean? It comes to a stage where I'm getting put through on goal and a slow defender's outpacing me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't want it to. I didn't want it to come to that stage where people are going to look back at videos and like, oh, that was what I remember of him, the guy who, who like was getting paced by so and so. Like, I didn't want it to come to that stage, so it was something that like I don't regret, and um, yeah, I still stand by my decision. Mm. What do you miss most about it? You know what? I think in football, you, you you're gonna miss the good times. You're not gonna miss the bad times. You're not gonna miss the bad times in football. I miss the good times of like. Played in teams that were challenging for things. The minor O'Neill years, they are the times that I miss of like having a great team and like going into every game thinking like I'm going to score before you with the players arguing like I'm going to score before you. Playing in a team that was like we can go to um, Anfield and win. We can go to Stamford Bridge and win. We can go to Old Trafford and win. They're scared of us. They're looking at videos of us. Do you know what mm. I mean? Not like we're scared of them. That they're the times I miss. Yeah, I miss the banter. I miss the everyday, the schedule. Do you know what I mean? You've got a schedule in football of like you're up. You've got to be here at nine. You've got to be here to travel. That's what I do miss, and that's what every player will miss. But mm. the main thing I miss is like playing in that great team that we had under Martin O'Neill before everyone got sold. Yeah. Uh, do you still watch the Villa? You, you get out now and again. Yeah, yeah, I go down a lot. The last game I went to was um, Watford at home this season, and it was incredible. Like to 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 watch as a fan, Villa fans over the years have like I don't know. Sometimes when when Villa have gone one 0 down, it's like you feel the atmosphere drop. That game against Watford, I was like, this is the Villa that I like, the Villa that I love, the Villa that Villa players need. The the fans got them that win, not the players. The fans got him like full house. It was like we went one nil down. They stayed with the players. They cheered the players on to get the two goals. It was like that was what the players needed, and that's what they give them. That's why even now, when people ask me about the rest of the season behind closed doors, I don't want that. I want Villa to play. If it's five home games they've got with forty-two thousand fans with the same atmosphere as Watford, mm. so like I definitely go down quite as much as I can, but. As well, I don't want to be like... People tell me he's silly, but I don't want to be the player that, like... Ex-player that, oh, we can't get rid of him. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to be like, like, oh, he's here again. So when I do go, I don't go into the executive. You know where the owners sit and the likes of Ian Taylor and Brian Little sit? I don't go into there. I want to be, like, sort of away from all that. I don't want to be, like, seen. Do you know what I mean? I try and, like, sneak in. And, like, I don't want to be, like... Oh, we can't get rid of him. That's why I don't go to the training ground. I don't want to be like one of them ex-players of like the manager's like, oh my God, he's back again. When you've had your era, you've had your era. Obviously, in the future, one day, my goal will be definitely to be a coach at at Villa for sure. But until that day comes, I'm sort of keeping my distance and letting the new era of them Villa players and them come through. You've done your coaching, haven't you? Over in Ireland, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm halfway through it, um, to be honest. I was um, meant to be going in June, but it's got rescheduled to do the um, the next half. But yeah, I'm halfway through it. And um, I'm enjoying it, to be honest. I'm, I'm doing bits at home um, on my laptop of like sessions and stuff. You know, it's something that I want to do because I enjoy the punditry um, to a certain extent, but football's my main passion. So even like the other day, um, I had a DM off um, a fan and his son was doing a drill that I did with my son here. It was just something that Kevin McDonald used to do with us. It's not an enjoyable one, but it's a good little drill you can do in your garden. Do you know what I mean? You don't need a lot of space to do it. Um, it's a little drill you can do with like your kid. But football is my passion. If I can coach one day and make a player improve and make a player get a career, that will give me joy. 
you know what I mean? It's not about money. It's not about anything like that. It's about loving football and giving you something back. If I can help a striker make a channel run and cut in, chop, do you know what I mean? And then um, use his left foot and um, show him how to finish with his right foot, different finishes or different sort of runs. And that if I can make a player a better player for doing that, that's something that I want to do in the future. That's mm-hmm. why I want to get educated first, get my badges before I start. And then I will start somewhere if that's, I don't really, I don't mind where it is. Do you know what I mean? If that's a, a team in Sutton, do you know what I mean? It's a, it is, that's what it will be. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? If that's where I start and I can help young players um, improve because mm-hmm. I think that's what clubs need to do more. I mean, like you see Chelsea, Chelsea, you've got ex-players in the clubs and what better for a 12-year-old or a 9-year-old, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 13-year-old to be taught by someone who's played at a high level. Do you know what I mean? They're going to, I think they're going to listen more, aren't they? They're mm-hmm. going to be like, all right, I'm going to listen to him. He made it. I want to make it. I'll listen to him more. You still playing five or side anything? You know what? We we play um we play. There's um a group of players that um through stands stands friends of a friends and um we play at um in Solly Hall. We play six aside. There's like a, a an Astro pitch. I can't say where it is because yeah, the news no. fans are coming towards me. So I can't tell you where it is. But it's in Solly Hall and like we play every Monday, Friday. Um, 6 p.m. and 6:30, 6:30 on a Monday, 6 on a Friday, and honestly, me and Stan are on opposite teams, and we're kicking each other, we're booting each other. Stan is so fit for a 40 year old, and like it's just something that like when you love football, you enjoy. Do you know what I mean? Like six aside with the lads, there's no no one there who's gonna like annoy us, or we can just play it as a fun. You know, the standards high as well, like. There's a WhatsApp group for it, so when you lose, you're you're getting hammered in the group. You know, it's just something you you you. I think most players who love football when they do retire will start playing. Do you know what I mean? I think when Jack retires, I'm sure Jack will be down there playing with me. Do you know what I mean? Like we try renegotiation to try and get Hutton down. Do you know what I mean? Like I think it's just something that you can't beat for fitness either. I mean, I do road runs, I do what bikes, I do treadmills, but football is the best. You know. So we can get um, Monday, Friday games like we, that we play a lot. You know, it's good for fitness as well. You know, keep some pounds off. So Stan still got it, is it? Yeah, he still got it. Yeah, but um, he still needs to close his legs a bit more because I do get a lot of megs on him. But like, honestly, like the quality he's got, like I still, I still think to myself now, like what Di Matteo done by not giving him a contract was criminal. Stan done all preseason. He done so much to get back into shape after his um, horrible illness, and I think any manager with any sort of heart pays you play. Stan wouldn't have been bothered about the the, the money that he would have been playing. Do you know what I mean? He loved Villa, give him a pay as you play deal or something, and and let him play. Do you know what I mean? He still had a couple of seasons left in him, and I think any other manager with a heart would have done that. That's why like I'll always dislike Dean Matteo anyway, but for that reason I'd always dislike him because Stan wasn't finished yet. Do you know what I mean? Mm. He, had to, he had he had two more years left in him. And even when I play with him now, you look at his quality, like, wow. He could have definitely played two more years holding mid, spraying balls about and starting off attacks. Do you know what I mean? So it's um, just a shame that he didn't get that chance to do it. Yeah, he turned out from the villa three times, he said, for jobs, coaching and stuff like that, which is a shame really. He's got a lot to give, hasn't he? This is what frustrates me about about um, the, the the Aston Villa and stuff like is like at the hierarchy is that so for me for instance I'm still learning to be a coach so I've I've not tried to to get into Aston Villa but someone of Stan's importance to Aston Villa some of Stan's experiences in the game do you know what I mean like I've never met a more hardworking person since we recovered from illness he has done every single possible course you could think of. If that's to be a coach, if that's to be a chief exec, if that's to be, do you know what I mean? All he's been doing is doing his UA for this, UA for that, all his like things. And a club like Aston Villa, like they're turning down him for coaching roles. It's for me, it's criminal to be honest. Like if that was Chelsea, do you know what I mean? <laughs> they make a role for you mm-hmm. at like clubs like Chelsea, at clubs like Man City, Man United. Look at Man United. You've got Nicky Butt there. You've got Chelsea, Joe Cole's in there, Ashley Cole's in there. 
that's the problem with Aston Villa that I think they don't give enough back to ex players. Imagine Stylian Petrov being given like the under 18s under 18s job. It's a no brainer. The under 18 manager has left to go to Solihull Moors. Stands applied for the job. Like if if I was anyone at Aston Villa, who else would you want to bring our next set of superstars through from the under 18s? Stands quality. Do you know what I mean? He's done the hard work of getting his badges. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just don't understand, like, who's in charge of it. Is it the academy director who's who makes the decisions? Can someone who, I don't know, someone higher above in the, the like, our chief exec, our owners, can they, do you know what I mean? Can they say, like, you know, like, we can overrule the academy director? Because if you ask any Villa fan out there now, who would they want to be? coaching Villas under 18s or Villas under 23s. You'd want Petrov in there, wouldn't you? So I just don't understand it. And like, before you know it, Stan's going to end up with a job somewhere else. The Villa have missed out. So I just mm. don't get it, to be honest. But what can I do? It's um, it's down to the, the club, isn't it? Yeah, well, then, Gab, we're going to end with the, the Gabby and Bandit Hall quiz here. So you've got five oh, questions, God. mate. I'm so, not good at quizzes, mate. First one is quite an easy one for you, I reckon. How old are you when you made your Villa debut? <laughs> I can't get any of these wrong, can I? Jesus. Yeah. Um, 19. Correct. There's one. One in the bag. So who was your first goal at Villa Park against? Charlton. Easy. Two, and two out of two. How many times are you booked? You know what? I used to get a lot of books for like kicking people off the ball. So I enjoyed fouling people. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I enjoy kicking people. Um, I'm guessing like 40, 40? 49. Good guess. These are that many yellows. What are you I know, I know. <laughs> Putting people in the board, don't you? <laughs> um, the last time we played for Villa, who were the opponents? Ooh. Sheffield United. Yeah, I'm gone. yeah not bad. Yeah. Uh, you should get this one as well. How many Premier League goals have you scored for Villa? Jeez, I'm not going to live this down. I might get this wrong. Um, Premier League, is it 76? 74, I've got it, yeah. Yeah, 74. Yeah. I've added to one that might not yeah. be given. Do you reckon that'll be, that'll be beaten? 100%. Like, all records are beaten, aren't they, one day? But the only thing that scares me about why I don't think it'll get beaten for a long time is that Villa sell. Villa are a selling club. Do you know what I mean? I stay because I love the club, but Villa are a selling club. They have been since I started. Um, if someone comes in, a striker comes in and scores... 10, 11 Premier League goals. It's going to take him seven seasons. Are Villa going to uh, be able to hold on to someone who's banging in that sort of goals? That's the only thing that like scares me about Villa. Do you know what I mean? If if you said like Man United, for instance, I'd say, of course, it's going to get beaten. Do you know what I mean? Because they're one of the top clubs. But Villa, for someone to get towards them numbers, would have probably been sold unless the new owners are going to change what's been happening in the past and keep our best players, then 100% it will get, it will get beaten. Uh, do you reckon Jack will stay? Just a quick, quick one. I actually think he will. I know um, people are 50-50, but I think he will because the club's built around him. You know what I mean? Villa will stay up, I'm confident. And then the club will be built around him again. He's captain. You know what I mean? He's posted pictures of him in the Villa, in, in the Villa Academy from like the start of the Academy, five, six... Do you know what I mean? It's similar to like my situation of like, yeah, I, I had chances to leave, but when the club means so much to you, do you know what I mean? The grass isn't always greener, is it? Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so I think you will stay, but I can't speak for him. You know, it's going to be his decision. It's going to be um, down to him. But if I was an owner of Aston Villa at the moment, I'll just turn my phone off. If if a player that is so crucial to your team would add Jackies to Aston Villa to get results, I'm not selling him. Because selling a player of Jack's calibre is going to cost you more money in the long run, even the transfer fee you get from not staying in the league. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for me, I'm turning my phone off in the summer if I'm the Villa owners. And then when, this, when the transfer window's over, I'll turn my phone on. So mm-hmm. he, he can't leave. That'll be my, my option on it. Thanks for your time today. All sorted, Gab. I yeah, so really no appreciate problem, that. Mate. Covered, yeah. covered everything there, so I had a, had a good hour with you. So. No, thanks so, for that, though. No worries, no mate. Problem, mate. Take care of yourself, Not yeah? Bad. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa.